You don't actually need to draw digitally in order to succeed as a professional illustrator, but you do need to know how to digitize your artwork. Hello everyone! Welcome to our business with Ness. I'm Ness and I'm a professional illustrator. So we see a lot of digital artwork out in the world. So many artists wonder if it's possible to succeed as an illustrator if you do traditional work like watercolor or pencil or whatever it is. And actually, yes, you can. There is nothing that says that you have to do digital artwork. And since most everyone else is doing that, when you do traditional media, actually, it can be a way to stand out from all the competition and make something that's really special and charming. So you don't need digital art to succeed, but you do need digital skills. You need to be able to transform your painting into a digital file, one that's clean, high resolution, in the correct format, something that companies will need if they want to use your artwork on their products. Photos of your artwork isn't going to cut it because they can be low quality or even if they're high quality, they can have uneven lighting or blurry spots. Even on social media, that doesn't look really professional, but to put on actual products or to work for companies, it's absolutely unacceptable. In the professional world, you need to be able to get a good scan of your artwork and the ability to clean it up afterwards and make it all ready for production. If you want to be able to create art prints, t-shirts, mugs, any products that you want, or to give your artwork to company to do the same, then in this video, I'm going to teach you how you can get a good scan and clean it up. Right before we get into it, if you're new here and you'd like to see more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell. The bell sends you a notification every time I upload a new video. This way you're sure that you won't miss any of the advice. All right, let's get started. First of all, you will need a scanner. If you don't have one, I have some recommendations for you. Personally, I use this Epson Workforce 7820. It is actually a printer that has a scanner functionality, but the quality is actually really good and I like it a lot because it scans up to 11 by 15 inches. I actually did a full unboxing and review of this scanner, so if you'd like to learn more about it, I will leave the link to this video somewhere on the screen and in the description as well. The price that you see here is in Canadian dollars, so if you are in US dollars or euros, it would be a bit less expensive for you. It can be a bit of an investment if you're just starting out, but something like this is really, really worth it because it can get such a great quality, but also because it's big, you don't have to stitch up in the computer. You can just scan it as it is. But if you can't afford this, that's fine. Even a smaller or much cheaper scanner would work perfectly okay. I myself grew up really poor and I saved to get myself a really cheap $60 HP scanner when I was in college. And for a long time, it did the work just fine. Cheaper scanners often won't uh, capture the colors quite as well. On my old scanner, I had trouble with pale colors. They used to kind of disappear and my greens would look very dull and muddy. But that's actually fine because those are things that you can fix afterwards. And I'm going to show you how in this video. The important thing is to get a good scan. So now it's time to actually scan your art. Most scanners have some sort of software like this where you can choose all of your settings. So let me uh, walk you through mine, but yours probably will have much similar options. So I click scan and I'm brought into this menu here and I can do a preview which is great because it takes less time and you get to decide on your settings and see if that's going to work out for you. These are the settings that I usually use. So color, you also have grayscale, but of course we want all the beautiful colors and 300 DPI resolution. My scanner goes all the way to 9,600. So you can go much higher if you want. Sometimes I do 600. The higher resolution, the bigger the file and the more detail you have. So if you want to enlarge your painting, then pick something uh, higher for the resolution. I'm gonna do 300. Most scanners have some sort of advanced settings like this. Usually I keep this all in the default, but if you find that your scanner scans, you know, really, really light and you can't get in all those little details because they disappear in the light, then you could lower the brightness a little bit so you can get a bit more detail and you can see in real time how it affects the preview here. My software also has detail adjustments where I could balance per color. So let's say my yellow always disappears 
then I could adjust just the yellow. There's tone correction here. So this is all a little bit more complicated and your software might not have this, but it could be useful if you have some problems with the image quality that you're getting right from the output. But mostly we're going to be able to modify that later in post-production in your Photoshop or GIMP software. So I'm going to go back to the main settings here and I'm going to hit preview. So here's the preview that it generated for me and right off the bat I can see I don't need quite so much of the flatbed so I'm just going to crop it a little bit. I just need this section. I'm noticing that the colors are a little bit too dark and flashy compared to the real painting. So if I wanted to I knew I could reduce the contrast, the saturation, uh, I could try to see if I can find something that works a little bit better for me but I prefer to adjust this in Photoshop later because I'm really going to be able to see better <laughs> what's going on. So I'm going to leave it like this. I think that's okay. And I'm going to go to scan. This is going to take longer. It's going to do a proper scan. So let's just see you again once that's done. So this is it. This is the scan that I have and you can do some more cropping or rotate. So I could rotate it like that or you know, you can do that also in post production in Photoshop later if you want. And then it's time to save your file. So you're going to have different options for what to do with it. I usually just save it directly on my computer. You have a few different file types, PDF, JPEG, TIFF, PNG. So you can decide whatever you prefer here. I usually do a JPEG, but if you wanted to have the highest quality, you can do a TIFF because this is a non lossy format. So this is the highest quality. You can decide where you want to upload it and the file name. So I'm going to do save and my scan is done. After scanning, you can bring your artwork into some sort of software in order to clean it up and do some adjustments. I personally use Adobe Photoshop. This is a paid software. It's on a monthly subscription, but you don't actually have to get the entire Creative Cloud subscription, which can be quite expensive. You can get what they call the photography plan, which includes just Photoshop plus a couple other things like Lightroom or whatever. I've never actually used that. Since it includes just Photoshop, it is much cheaper. It's around $10 per month. So that can be a good option. But if you don't want to pay for software, you're on a strict budget, that's fine because you can use other software that are free, such as GIMP, for example. GIMP is completely free and it actually has most of everything that's in Photoshop. Not completely 100% everything, but most of the things we're going to talk about today. Another one that is free is Krita with a K. That's also a really great software that you can use to do your post-production. So next it's time to do the post-production on your scan and get it looking amazing. But right before we get into that, I'd really like to hear from you. Do you have a scanner or do you usually take photos of your artwork? If you do have a scanner, how comfortable are you with cleaning up your scans professionally on a scale of say one to 10? Are you very comfortable or are you not comfortable at all? I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. And even if you're not comfortable at all, don't worry because I'm about to share with you all of the tips. So here we are in Photoshop with our first painting, the butterfly. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is trim the edges because you can see here the line here is the edge of the paper. We want to get that out of the way. So we're going to go and get the crop tool. This is this little thing here. Click it. And then you can just drag the edges out like this to crop it however you prefer. So my paper was like this, but if I want, I can crop it a little bit more. I can do exactly the crop that I want to try to have it centered. Okay, so this looks good to me. I'm gonna do enter and this is the crop. If you have a specific format that you need for your project, you could also create a new document and paste your painting into it to make sure that you have the correct dimensions. So you would do file new and then you can pick your dimension. So let's say that we are doing a four by six inches in 300 DPI. You can also choose your color mode. This is RGB, but maybe we need to be in CMYK. For example, let's create our document. So this is what we have here. I'm going to go back in my painting, which I opened in Photoshop. I'm going to do Control A to select the entire canvas and then Control C for copy. Back in my new document, I'm going to do Control V to paste it. And then using the select tool, I'm going to right click in my canvas and select free transform. 
So then I can move it around. I can make it smaller. Center it in my composition. Where it fits exactly where I need it to be. I can use the arrow keys to move it just a little bit. And this looks good to me, so I'm going to do enter. And now I have my painting in my 4x6 template that I need it to be for my project. So I can just go ahead and close my original. We're not going to need it anymore. And now it's time to do our basic adjustments because this looks pretty good like this. But if you zoom in, you can see that, you know, there are some little imperfections on the paper, some stains. We can see the paper texture quite a bit. And you can also see that it's darker in some areas than others. So this is not considered a professional file. We have to clean this up before we can use it professionally, either for your own products or to send it to a company. So in Photoshop, there is a function that is really, really great and it's adjustment layers. You can get them in the layer panel at the bottom. It's a little circle that's half dark and half white. You can click on it and you have a whole selection of different adjustments that you can make. Like for example, brightness contrast or hue saturation. So these are to modify your colors and your lighting. But the great thing about adjustment layers is that it doesn't destroy your original painting. It creates an adjustment separately on a different layer. So to give you an example, if I do brightness contrast and then I make it much darker, this adjustment is on its own separate layer. I can turn it on and off to see the difference and I can double click in it at any time to adjust what I'm actually doing with this. My original painting underneath has not been touched. So if I change my mind, I haven't actually lost anything. And that's why I much prefer these adjustment layers. When you do your adjustments, I recommend you have your original painting next to you so that you can check the colors. You want to get as close as possible to the original. So the first adjustment layer that's going to be your best friend is the levels. This is really great to get rid of any paper texture in the background. So you have three little cursors here in your window. This cursor on the right represents all the light colors in your painting. The middle one represents all the grayscale colors and the dark one represents all the darker colors. By moving them, you can decide how light or dark are the dark colors or how light or dark are the light colors. This allows you to make very precise adjustments. So in order to get rid of this background texture, we need the light colors, the background to be whiter. So we're going to take this cursor and we're going to drag it a little bit more towards the middle. But by doing that, we got some of these colors inside the butterfly to be a little bit too light. So now we're going to take our grayscale colors and we're going to drag this one to the right a little bit to try to get back some of them. So you can keep adjusting these cursors so it ends up exactly where you need it to be. Sometimes you may have to compromise a little bit. In my case, I'm not getting rid of everything in this corner, but if I lower this cursor too much, I lose stuff that is inside my butterflies that I don't want to lose. So I'm going to put it somewhere around here and playing with this cursor, I think this looks about right to me. But again, this is an adjustment layer. So if I change my mind later, I'll be able to go back and modify it. One thing that adjusting the levels has done is now these colors are really, really saturated, much too saturated. So I'm going to create another adjustment layer and I'm going to do hue saturation. Now I can lower the saturation a little bit, try to get it exactly where it was in the original painting. I don't want my colors to get muddy, but I also, I don't want them to be so flashy. So. I'm trying to find a happy medium. Now, sometimes with adjusting the colors, the problem is that it adjusts everything at the same time. So for example, if we change the hue, we're changing all of these colors at the same time, which is not what we want. Maybe your blue colors ended up being a little bit too greenish. You want to make your blues more blue, but you don't want all the colors to switch around. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is, because you can choose here where it says master, you can click and you have a list of what is actually going to affect. So you could select your blues and remove the green from them without affecting all the other colors. Isn't that great? 
In my case, this red has become a little bit too dark, but all the rest of the colors look pretty okay. So I'm going to select the red and I'm going to reduce a little bit the saturation, maybe get a little bit more lightness in there. I'm not certain exactly right away what I'm doing. I'm just playing with it a little bit, trying to find the right combination. But you can see that I'm not affecting the entire image. I'm just affecting this red. So I like it a little bit more magenta than red and a little bit less saturated. So I think I'm going to do that and I can see the difference by turning it on and off. So I think I like that, but from the original, it's still, it's a little bit different. So I could make more adjustments if I wanted to, to get back to that. I think maybe my levels were a little bit too intense. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to make this a little bit less intense. In this level windows, you can also select which color you want to affect. So if I wanted to get my magentas a little bit more dark, but not the rest of the colors, I could do that. I'm losing a lot of the soft colors here. So I'm going to go back, try to adjust properly. I think my yellows are very saturated, so I'm going to make them a little bit more soft. Okay, so I think I'm now very close to what my original painting looked like. I'm very satisfied with this. At this point, if you wanted to, you can also make changes if there was something in the original painting that you didn't like. So for example, in my case, I didn't like how this mixing of the blue and the yellow ended up making this transition look very green. I don't think it looks pretty on the butterfly. So I can go and select the greens and I can try to fix that somehow, maybe with a light transition, it looks a little bit less awkward. Okay, so I think I like this better. So I worked in my little improvement there. So with these two adjustments, level and hue saturation, it's pretty much going to be almost everything that you need to adjust the colors in your paintings. But now we have to go in and make some corrections. We have some little bits that got stuck. We have a little bit of smearing here. And of course, in this corner, it's all a little bit dark. So let's go and fix that. I'm now going to show you some other tools that do directly affect your painting. So in order to not lose the original, I always recommend go on your original painting layer, right click and do a duplicate layer. You always want to have a copy right there just in case you need to go back. So in order to fix some of this kind of dark paper texture going on here. The best tool that I've found for this is the dodge tool. So you can get it right here. It's the little pin looking thing. Click here. And what this does is make it very overexposed. So as you can see, it got rid of almost everything. Sometimes if you have something very dark, like a little speck of dust or something, it might not completely get rid of it. The thing though is that if you go over your painting, it's going to do the same thing over the painting. So you want to be careful and kind of skirt the edges. If you need, you can right click in order to change your brush. You can make it smaller so you can go in, do the little details so that you don't ruin your painting. And you can go all around like this fixing everything that you need, all of these little details. Sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of a texture in the background, but it depends if your texture is uneven. So if there are some places where it's darker than others, this looks like bad quality. So you usually you want to have a very even and subtle texture. If your painting is also going to be printed on something like paper or fabric, the product that it's going to be printed on also has its own texture. So doubling up on the texture could end up looking quite messy. So I'm just going all around and fixing that background texture. I'll see you on the other side. All right, I'm all done. And if you turn this layer on and off, you can see the difference. So we've really cleaned out that background. It looks much better now, but there's a couple spots where I wasn't able to get rid of something with this tool. I have this dark spot right here that would not go because it's too dark. And I also have a little spot here 
where I have some smearing and it did get paler but it just won't completely go. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite tools to get rid of that. The first one is the spot healing brush tool. It's a little band-aid so if you click on that you have this little correcting brush. I think I would like something a little bit smaller and we're going to go get this other spot right here and all that you do is just go over it and it will remove whatever it is. This tool uses the surrounding area to give you the information so sometimes it won't work. Let's say if I'm trying to remove this spot it kind of used this other information and it didn't quite remove it. So sometimes you can try, it might not always work, but most of the time it will work. And you can remove some little spots like this using this tool. So I recommend that you go around your painting, zoomed in like this, and you try to see if there's any little dust, blemishes, or anything like that that you want to fix. And you can just zap them with this tool, it's really great. So I went all around my painting and I think I'm satisfied with how this looks now, but I still do need to fix that one spot. I could try it with the correction tool, but let's try something else. This other tool that is great for fixing little mistakes and imperfections is the clone stamp tool. So if you click on it, you also get a brush. This time I'm going to use a little bit of a bigger one. Okay. this. Sounds good. So this tool works in two steps. First, you have to sample, like with a stamp, you have to put it in the ink. So you're going to hold Alt on your keyboard and it's going to change your cursor. Now you click somewhere. So you have sampled the background and now you can go over and you're kind of going to see a preview of what it looks like. I think I have it in pen pressure sensitivity, so I'm going to turn that off and I'm just going to brush it over. When you hold it down, you can see the little cross right there on the screen. It shows you where it's sampling it from. So for a white background, it's not really necessary to use a tool like the clone stamp, but when you have a fully painted area, for example, like this wing, I could sample the pink here and then I could use this to delete some of my spots. I can resample anytime I want. And this gives you a much more seamless result when you need to do things like this. It copied the color, the texture, so it blends in seamlessly. If I had tried to paint it over instead to hide it with a normal brush tool, the texture wouldn't have been the same. It would have been much more obvious. In this case though, I actually did not want to remove the spots. So I'm gonna go back <laughs> in my history. All right, so zooming out, I think this looks pretty good. This is pretty much what I wanted. So this would be ready to save. But another thing that I wanted to show you is how to remove the background and make the background transparent. This could be useful in many, many different situations. For example, if I wanted to make these butterflies into stickers, I need them to be little PNGs with a transparent background. So what I would do first is save this so I don't lose the original, so I don't lose any of my changes. And then I would make a copy of this file and we can go ahead and use the crop tool to crop just this butterfly that we're going to work on now. All right, enter. And I'm going to select all of my layers by holding shift. So all of these layers are selected and I'm going to do control E to merge them. Only do that if you have saved a copy before. So now in order to cut out the background, we're going to use the magic wand tool. So it is right here it is the magic wand. Click. So we can click on one color, for example, the white and select it. Now the problem with that is that sometimes your selection won't be too excellent. So for instance, here it selected some of the inside of the wing because that's white too and it didn't select all of these little particles that were left on the side. You can make the magic wand tool more sensitive or less sensitive by using the tolerance here. So 10 tolerance is quite low. I'm going to do control D to deselect and I'm going to try again. So I'm going to get this tolerance up to let's say 30 and we're going to try again. 
So now you can see the selection all around is much better. It did still select the inside of the wing, but we can fix that later. I think this is probably much better to get started with. I'm also going to select this outside part. Now I could go ahead and do backspace to delete everything inside my selection. But <laughs> you know me now, I don't like to do anything that is permanent like this. So instead we're going to do a mask. So with this area still selected, I'm going to go ahead and click this icon here at the bottom, the rectangle with the circle inside. And this is going to add a layer mask. Click. So now the butterfly disappeared. That's because our layer mask is actually inverted. So I'm going to click on this uh, black and white butterfly that you can see here. And I'm going to do control I to invert the selection. It's hard to tell the difference now because the background was also white. So I'm going to click the little plus here at the bottom to add a layer. And we're going to put some color on the background, let's say some green, just so we can see a little bit what we're doing. So using the paint bucket, I'm going to fill this. And now we can see what's going on. So back to our selection, click on the little black and white butterfly. And using the brush tool, we can now make corrections to this selection. How the mask works is everything that is black on this layer here is going to be erased and everything that is white is going to remain. So we have some black inside where <laughs> this wing has been erased and we want to get it back. So I'm going to get the white and paint this section back so that I can get this back. I can make this uh, smaller so I can make some more precise adjustments and go right ahead and get all of this back that I wanted to get back. So if you see there's too many white pixels remaining on the outside, so we could try to get, let's say, a, a greedier kind of brush and make it really small to go very detailed. And then we switch back to black because we want to remove that. And then we could go on the edges and try to delete some of those white pixels that remain on the edges. Now, honestly, this amount of white on the edges, that's fine, that's not a lot, but sometimes with the magic tool, there can be some things that remain that are a little bit more than that, that are kind of annoying that we want to fix. Ah, like this, for example. <laughs> so you can look around and you can remove that from your selection. To make sure that you have a really clean background removal. So now we have the background all cut out and what I would do to export my butterfly would be right click on this layer and then quick export as PNG. So this would export just this layer as a PNG with transparent background which is exactly what we would want for something like a sticker. This technique can be very useful for other things as well. For example, when you are making repeating patterns, you might want to remove the background from all of your different motifs so you can then arrange them into a pattern. And I have a tutorial that shows how to do that. I will link it uh, at top of the video and also in the description if you want to go and see that. But for right now, I have just one more thing to show you and that's how to remove the background from a line art. So I have scanned this black and white line art piece to show you an example of this technique. Isolating the line art on a different layer can be extremely useful for a bunch of different techniques. For instance, if you want to color the line art, etc. So here's how I do it. You'll be surprised just how simple it is. First, I would right click on this background and duplicate it. There we go. Now I don't need the background anymore, so I will create a new layer which I will use the paint bucket to fill this with white and control E to merge this back again with the background. So now I have my painting on a different layer. I will do the same basic adjustments as I showed you how to do in the beginning of this video. So first the crop tool and we will crop this deer however we like. Maybe I want a little bit more space at the top so I could also do that. Ah. I'm getting green here because this is my background color. So I'm going to do Ctrl Z to go back. And you want to make sure that your background color is white. And then 
when you extend the crop, that's what it's going to do. Enter. So now I have to do adjustments to make this paper color white as I want it to be. I'm going to do a levels adjustment layer and wow, look how quickly it cleaned up. I want my line art to be as black and clear as possible and the background to be completely white. So I think that works out very nicely before and after. That's a big difference, isn't it? You also would need to go in and delete any little mistakes that are happening. So I would use the spot healing brush and for example, remove this little spot, go everywhere and make sure that you've removed all the little spots because with this technique, the little spots would be preserved and you don't want that. So you need to delete them before we go ahead. So there we go, this looks good. And now I want to merge down this adjustment layer into my uh, main painting layer. But first I'm going to duplicate it just in case. <laughs> and now I can select both of these layers using the control key and control E to merge down. I'm going to turn off this one because I don't need it. So now it's time to separate the lines from the background and you will see just how easy it is. So you need to go into the channels panel. So I have mine open right here, but if you don't have it, you can simply click on window in the navigation menu and then select channels to go get that window. And in this panel, you're going to go at the bottom and you can see this little circle with dotted line. You're going to click it and it's going to select all your line art as easy as that. However, it has selected the white, not the black, and we want the opposite. So you're going to go on select and then you're going to click inverse and it's going to inverse your selection. So now we're selecting the black, not the white. You're going to click the little plus in the layer panel to create a new layer. And now we're going to fill it with black. So you can click on edit and then scroll down here to fill and then select black for the color that we are going to fill with and okay. And now it has filled just the selection of black. So you can do control D to deselect. And if you turn off your original painting, then all that's left is this layer. Let's turn off the background so you can see exactly what happened. Only this line art is now completely separated. The great thing with this trick is that it works in transparency. So all of these lines that were kind of more grayish than black, they are still filled with black, just half transparent black. This is great because if you decide to color the background, let's say in green, it's going to look like this instead of having a whitish grayish line on a colored background, which would look really odd. So this technique really is the absolute best that I have found to isolate this line art in a way that works in all the situations. It is really, really good. Now you could create some more layers underneath so that you can color inside the lines or you could color your line art if you create a new layer and then right click and create clip and mask. Now you could select any color that you want with the brush and you could paint your line art. You could choose different colors for different sections if you want and just go right ahead and do whatever you like. So there we go. These are my favorite techniques for cleaning up scans, digitizing them and making them ready for any kind of thing that you would want to do with them. Now that you can create high quality professional digital files from your art, you're ready to get professional contracts if you wish. And if you're not sure where to get started, I have a free guide that you might enjoy. It's called seven surprising ways to find illustration clients. It is completely free and I will leave the link to that in the description below so you can go and download it. But that's it for me today. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and found it helpful. And if you did, then don't forget to leave me a like, comment or subscribe to help our small channel grow. Thank you so, so much for being here. I appreciate you and I will see you soon with another video. Bye bye.